People continue to mobilize in Ecuador against the government of Lenin Moreno. The U.S. has begun withdrawing troops from northeast Syria. And representatives from the U.S. and China will meet this week to seek a solution for their trade war. Hello and welcome to Telesur. I'm Doris Polo in Quito and this is From the South. Protests continue in Ecuador against austerity measures imposed by President Lenin Moreno. People have been gathering in different areas of the capital, Quito, primarily to condemn a recent fuel price hike and are calling for the president's resignation. Across the Sierra region, roads remain closed as many cities have been left paralyzed. Classes have also been suspended for a third day. Protests started last Thursday and have been met with violent repression from security forces. Soon after the protests started, the government declared a state of emergency. The Pan-American Highway north of Quito was one of the main roads blocked early on Monday morning. The community of San Miguel del Comun used posts and debris to close the highway in protest at the fuel price rises and other austerity measures. We're protesting at economic measures because this really hurt us. They affect everyone. I myself need to have dialysis at the clinic, but I can't get there. So I have to go home and wait until I can get there. Now, the indigenous mayor of Kayambe, to the north of Quito, has called for unity among all sectors to prepare for a march on the capital. He said truck drivers in Kayambe had rejected the deal reached by their national leaders with the government and would maintain their strike. I want to ask you, comrades, to build maximum unity and prepare so that this day a big delegation can set off from the central square in Cayambe and go to Quito. We will accompany them on Tuesday, and on Wednesday, we will take the city of Quito. The only objective is to revoke Decree 883, which raises the price of fuel. So we need unity and we need to organize. On Sunday night, social media was flooded with videos of military-grade tanks rolling into the Ecuadorian capital, Quito. The tanks have reportedly surrounded the presidential palace ahead of the arrival of a mass mobilization of indigenous people from outside the city. Speaking on Sunday night, the country's defense minister, Osvaldo Harin, justified the presence of the tanks, saying they were not armed and were simply a precautionary measure. He also warned people not to provoke the armed forces. The United Nations Human Rights Office for South America has expressed its concern about the use of force on protesters. Our correspondent Denise Herrera has the latest from the center of Quito where a group of school bus drivers is protesting against the fuel price rises. Good morning. The state of exception continues in Ecuador. The decision came after the massive strike of the social organizations of workers and indigenous people who are against the economic measures announced by President Lenin Moreno. As you can see behind me, we are at the, one of the main avenues in Quito, Eloy Alfaro Avenue, and here the citizens are against also the economic measures imposed by President Lenin Moreno, they said that these measures are affecting their rights, their days. So they are against and they said they are supporting the social movements of indigenous movement against these measures. This strike continues. Recently, the government said that they will give a press conference to respond of these latest events in Ecuador. But until now, we don't have a concrete response of the government and these economic measures continuing in Ecuador. That was our correspondent, Denise Herrera, with that report. Now, Ecuador's national indigenous organization has declared a state of emergency in their lands. In a statement, Konaye said that any military or police officer who enters indigenous land without authorization will be detained. According to reports, close to 2,000 security forces have already been detained by indigenous people. Meanwhile, a total blockage of roads have been reported in provinces with the largest percentage of indigenous populations, such as Cotopaxi, Imbabura, and Chimborazo. 
We are the ones who are losing with this crisis, with this rise that the nefarious government has done. We do not agree with it. Until they repeal it, we will have to take these measures and we will go to the last consequences. As part of their own state of emergency, an indigenous community in Toakazo, Cotopaxi, detained a group of soldiers. They took away the members of the armed forces on the back of pickup trucks, while other indigenous activists drove their army buses in convoy. They have said they are treating the soldiers with complete respect, but that any military who invade their territory could be submitted to indigenous justice, which is recognized in the Ecuadorian constitution. Shifting gears now, Haitians are bracing for more upheaval as protesters demanding the president's removal pledge to remain on the streets this week. Last Friday saw mass protests in the capital, Port-au-Prince, against crippling fuel shortages, ballooning inflation and corruption. During the demonstrations, a Molotov cocktail was thrown into the premises of immigration and emigration building. Friday's unrest came after weeks of protests in which 17 people were reportedly killed. Trinidad and Tobago's finance minister, Colum Imber, has just begun his presentation of the government's fourth annual budget. However, this is overshadowed by the government's plan to subsequently debate a motion concerning the elections and Boundaries Commission's local government draft order. The order needs to be passed to facilitate holding of local government elections expected by year end. The unusual occurrence has sparked uproar by the opposition. Imber is expected to speak for at least they three hours, following which MPs and will debate the EGC 100, order. We understand how we make In Barbados, the retail prices of gasoline, diesel and kerosene have decreased effective midnight Sunday, October 6th. The price of gasoline has dropped by 16 cents per litre, while the price of diesel has decreased by one cent. Consumers will also see a reduction of four cents per litre in kerosene prices. These price adjustments are in keeping with government's policy of allowing retail prices to be reflective of those on the international market. Hundreds turned out for a rally held by Argentina's left-wing candidate Alberto Fernandez, the likely winner in this month's polls. Fernandez beat President Mauricio Macri by a landslide in the primary elections known as PASO in August. The shock result rattled Argentina's debt and currency markets, driving the peso and bonds to record lows as investors worried about the country's shift away from neoliberalism. Argentinians will head to the polls on October 27th to decide on their country's future. And with that, we'll take a short break. Don't go anywhere. Welcome back. The United States has begun pulling troops from northeast Syria, making way for Turkish troops to face off against Kurdish-led forces, which until now have been a key U.S. ally. Thousands of captives have also been handed over to Turkey. The Kurdish-led forces, who played a major role in Washington's war in Syrian territory, have denounced the move as a stab in the back. In January, President Trump threatened to devastate Turkey economically if it attacked Kurdish forces. Regarding this matter, after our talk in the evening on this issue, the withdrawal has started, as President Trump stated. Now, counterparts are carrying out their work and will continue to do so. We will most likely hold our U.S. visit in the first half of the following month. This visit will take place in Washington. While there will be meetings between the delegations, face-to-face -face meetings will allow us the chance to discuss in depth the relations between Turkey and the United States, as well as the development in the region. 
Meanwhile, a top Trump ally has called for a reversal of the U.S. president's Syria border pullback. U.S. Senator Lindsey Graham has taken to Twitter to comment on Trump's decision on North Syria, calling it a disaster in the making. Graham also announced plans to introduce a Senate resolution opposing the move. Our correspondent in Damascus, Hisham Wanous, has the details. The invading U.S. troops have withdrawn from their positions of, in the north of Syria. The U.S. authorities say they have pulled back eight kilometers from the Tal Arkham base and also from control posts in this area, where Turkey is planning to begin a military operation against the Kurdish separatist fighters of the so-called Syrian Democratic Forces. Turkey calls them terrorists and says they are endangering its national security. This decision by Turkey comes after the failure of talks to create a supposed safe zone in the north of Syria. In August, Turkey and the United States did agree to set up a coordination center and they began joint patrols as a step towards creating the safe zone. But they couldn't agree on how far such a zone would extend. Turkey wanted it to reach 32 kilometers from the Turkish border. The Turkish government spokesperson has insisted that this military operation will not be directed against the territorial integrity of Syria. He said it only intends to clear the area of what he called Kurdish terrorist elements and then set up a safe zone to house Syrian refugees who are currently in Turkey. The United States has made clear that its forces will not take part in this operation and that Turkey will be responsible for the members of the Islamic State group who are currently being held by the Kurdish militias, the SDF, for its part, has said it will respond with an all-out war against Turkish forces right along the border if they launch this attack. And it has criticized the United States for failing to stand by its commitments. The Syrian government has not yet responded to all these declarations. But it has previously said that the presence of Turkish and U.S. troops on Syrian soil is illegal and a violation of Syria's sovereignty. After six days of unrest in Iraq, which has so far left over 100 dead, the Iranian government has called on citizens from the neighboring nation to show restraint. Clashes between security forces and protesters have revived fears of a new spiral of violence that could suck in influential militia groups and be exploited by the Islamic State armed group. The Islamic Republic is making a determined effort to help build a strong, secure and free Middle East for all the countries. In this regard, we are always concerned and saddened to see insecurity and unrest in neighboring countries, and we want to see peace and stability in all the countries of the region. In this regard, the recent events in Iraq have brought sadness and caused concern for the Iranian nation and the Iranian government. In recent days, while the people of Iraq and the Iraqi government have been preparing for one of the world's major cultural and religious events, and while the region has been taking steps towards peace and stability, we have witnessed bitter events in place that have unfortunately led to loss of many lives. The government of Iraq has assured that there has not been clashes between its security forces and the protesters. The government has blamed other elements who have taken advantage of the situation and committed criminal acts. We urge the great people of Iraq to pursue their grievances and demands through legal and democratic channels. The citizens of Iraq should be mindful that while they pursue their demands, there are elements with bad intent who are ready and waiting to take advantage of the situation. Rwandan authorities say rebels arrested after a weekend attack that killed 14 civilians told them they were from the Hutu militia based in neighboring DR Congo. Rwandan security forces had killed 19 persons blamed for the attack, while the authorities have paraded five suspects. The individuals who killed 14 people, mainly with knives, they found them at home. But the security forces and the Rwanda Defense Forces did a good job. They were able to shoot 19 of them and five were arrested. Of the five who were arrested, most say they were members of the Democratic Forces for the Liberation of Rwanda, meaning the genocidal terrorist movement that committed the 1994 genocide in 1994. On Thursday and Friday this week, negotiators from the world's two biggest economies will sit down in Washington to try to find a solution to the long-running China-U.S. trade war, which threatens the entire world economy. 
No doubt the world will be watching when China and the United States sit down for a 13 round of trade talks in Washington at the end of this week. The context is even more complicated than expected as impeachment proceedings against Donald Trump move forward. China's position on the trade talks remain firm. We hope that both sides will be able to meet halfway and reach a mutually beneficial agreement that has win-win results for all. The talks will begin with hopes of an understanding to postpone the increase in tariffs, but it is not clear how the negotiations will be affected by the recent volatility on the markets and the impeachment against Donald Trump. President Trump's actions throughout this trade war have increased tension and done a lot of damage to relations between the two countries. So Chinese people no longer see the United States as a negotiation partner that can be trusted. Although Trump denies it, U.S. companies and consumers are already feeling the impact of increased tariffs on China. Beijing is seeking opportunities in other markets to offset the losses imposed by Washington. In recent months, the government has signed more than 30 bilateral agreements. I think China and the United States should sit down to talk, but the U.S. cannot expect China to back off. China has more power today and they have to respect that. The trade war isn't good for anyone. It affects our economy and that of other countries as prices go up. The effects of this trade war reach far beyond the borders of China and the United States. That's why countries all over the world will be watching what happens in Washington and hoping the two countries reach an agreement to overcome their differences. More stories coming up, including protests outside the home of British Prime Minister Boris Johnson as part of climate change demonstrations. Stay with us. Parts of London have ground to a halt as climate change activists block the road outside the home of Prime Minister Boris Johnson. Police officers surrounded and threatened to arrest activists on the ground in an effort to stop the protest from spreading further down Whitehall. Only ambulances and bicycles are able to come through the mass of activists lying on the road outside Downing Street. Climate activists are attempting to force political action in the face of a planetary crisis. It's the beginning of a series of week-long protests demanding new climate policies. Well, we're here because the government's not doing enough on the climate emergency. And the key word is emergency, right? They declared an emergency after the rebellion in April. Uh, and then we've seen like surprisingly little, little action. So we're here to really like push home, this is an emergency, you know, we only get one planet uh, and so we're here to try and defend it. We're here today because if we don't do something right now in response to what scientists, academics and people in the know, far more knowledgeable than me or him or anyone else um, that I know of really, um, have said is the only way forward to protect our planet from complete devastation and that means the extinction of not just me, uh, my sisters, my, my family, my friends, it's everyone's future and I don't want to live in a world where we're going to be climate change refugees. That's what scientists have predicted will happen uh, if we don't do something faster and it is happening right now. And in Germany, climate activists have also blocked the major traffic hub in the capital city of Berlin. Protesters are urging the government to adopt climate policies that will bring the country's CO2 emissions down to zero by 2025. 
We are in the middle of Grosser Stern Square. Below the Victory Column, an Extinction Rebellion blocked the entire square, meaning five main thoroughfares are currently blocked. We are roughly 1,200 activists from across Germany as well as Sweden, Poland, France and Switzerland. We are peacefully blocking this main square in the middle of Berlin. We demand from the German government to immediately declare a state of climate emergency. As Extinction Rebellion, As Extinction Rebellion we demand that net emissions be reduced to zero by 2025 as part of an emergency program, as well as an immediate halt to the loss of biodiversity. What we are also demanding, and this is the interesting part, is that there be a citizens' gathering which votes on the necessary measures. Extinction Rebellion will never make concrete policy proposals. We are saying the issue has to be handed back democratically to the citizens, who then decide on the measures together. Meanwhile, German Chancellor Angela Merkel says the climate package must include CO2 money, monitoring rather, to pass cabinet. Monitoring is an essential issue in our climate protection plan. Now, there is a certain nervousness about it, and that's why I want to be very clear. Monitoring will be transparently enshrined in the climate protection package. Otherwise, I won't allow us to pass it. This is expected to be on Wednesday, and we are working on it right now. And I will make sure that it will be a reliable, and verifiable, and transparent monitoring. Canada will head to elections on October 21st to elect members of Parliament and the Office of Prime Minister. For some insight into how things are looking, we spoke to the candidate of the Communist Party of Canada, Drew Garvey. Here's what he had to say. The revelations that Trudeau made several racist uh, portrayals of racialized people by by uh, dressing up, uh, you know, for 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 a number of years, stretching over a 10 year period, made quite an impression on, on the voting public in Canada this election. But what is not really, unfortunately, uh, part of the conversation across Canada is Canada's foreign policy and the need for a real foreign policy of peace and disarmament, which is one of the main reasons we, the Communist Party, decided to run in the riding of Christia Freeland. And those crimes are many, like you said. Uh, for example, this was on a vague vote. A band of troops, one old Canadian troops are now in, in Mali, in Eastern Europe, in Ukraine, uh, in Iraq. Um, so this is a, an, an expansion and a deepening of uh, Canada's imperialist role around the world. And of course, uh, Canada's leading role that they're playing in the regime change efforts in Venezuela, selling arms to the Middle East, um, and also tr trying to work with Trump to isolate China and, uh, and also attacking Russia. Trudeau was elected in 2015, promising uh, a new nation-to-nation -nation relationship with Indigenous people. But in the end, at the end of the day, it's been more of the same. And uh, most Canadians, and especially Indigenous peoples, recognize this. Uh, the, the most telling, uh, well, two, two telling examples of this were the buying of the Kinder Morgan pipe pipeline in order to force it through, despite uh, protests of many First Nations along the route and also the invasion of the Unistoten camp and the force, uh, forcing through a pipeline on Wet'suwet'en territory earlier this year. Um, so those were stark examples, but fundamentally there has not been a change in terms of the genocidal, the genocidal policy of the Canadian state. There remains a, so, a suicide crisis on reserves, there remain boil, boil water advisories. So what the Communist Party calls for is the immediate um, introduction of the UN Declaration of Indigenous Peoples into legislation in Canada. And the most important part of this is the right to veto uh, development that affects First Nations land. And this is a step towards real self-determination and sovereignty of Indigenous nations in this country. And it's something that uh, the Liberals and the Conservatives um, say is not necessary, which is ridiculous. Fundamentally, we, have, we see Canada as a multinational uh, state. And we need a new equal and voluntary partnership of First Nations, of English Canada, of Quebec, of Acadians. And we need a new constitution based on equality of these nations if we're going to live together on this, on this land. Uh, and right now, it's just more of the same old uh, oppression from Ottawa. And we end with this reminder. 43 years ago, Cuba experienced tragedy when an attack against a Cubana de Aviación flight from Barbados took the lives of 73 people. Let's take a look back at one of the most devastating terrorist attacks executed by the United States Central Intelligence Agency.
October 6th, 1976, flight 455 of Cubana de Aviación Airlines was heading to Trinidad and Tobago when it suddenly registered two explosions after taking off from Barbados, where it had a layover. The terrible event left 73 people dead, among them the Cuban fencing national youth team, a group of Guyanese students, and five Koreans. The act was orchestrated in Caracas by the Cuban terrorists Luis Posado Cariles and Orlando Bosch. Those responsible for the explosion were Venezuelan citizens Hernan Ricardo Lozano and Freddy Lugo, who were later sentenced to 20 years in prison. The then president, Fidel Castro, assured there was no doubt that the U.S. Central Intelligence Agency took part in the terrorist attack. And speaking to the Cuban people, he expressed his suffering and outrage. We can say that the pain is being shared. The pain is being multiplied. Millions of Cubans are crying right now, together, for all those close to the victims of this atrocious crime. And when an energetic and forceful nation cries, Injustice trembles. Motherland or dead, we will succeed. Bosch was absolved of all charges, but the Venezuelan justice system proved Posado Carillas' involvement in the case. However, in 1985, he escaped from the prison where he was being processed. Despite being responsible for this and many other crimes, both spent the last years of their lives under U.S. government protection. 43 years after the terrorist attack that shook the Cuban people, the families of the 73 passengers aboard the Cuban flight are still coping with the loss and the pain it meant for them. The sense of their loved ones will last forever. And with that, we've come to the end of this news brief. You can find these and many other stories on our website at telesurenglish.net. For our viewers in Africa, remember you can find us on Stars at Channel 461 in South Africa and Channel 539 in Nigeria. And join us on social media. For Tell Us Your English, I'm Doris Polo. Thank you for watching.